The Seventh-day Adventist reform movement has its historical origin in Europe during the First World War. At that time, faithful souls stood forward to proclaim that they could not violate the law of God, and for this, they were removed from the fellowship of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Following the war, they were denied readmittance to the church, and what is today the Seventh-day Adventist reform movement was formed in 1925. Now, almost a century later, one of the most frequent questions that we're asked is, what is the difference between the reform movement and the mainline SDA church? This mini-series will help you begin your own personal investigation by outlining a few of the theological differences between us. Before we begin, it's important to state that at no time do we believe ourselves to be superior to any other church. We firmly believe in the freedom of conscience and believe that souls will be led to worship together who have a common faith. Reformers assemble together to have a church which holds to the old historic paths of Adventism. While modernism and progressivism are popular ways to go, reformers take the words of inspiration given to Isaiah as our guide. In Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 12, we read, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. This means that we have no creed and accept no conviction that is not consistent with the revealed Word of God. And as this was the position of early Adventism, you can basically answer the initial central question this way. Reformers are just Adventists who seek to practice the original principles of Adventism. In Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20 we read, To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. There can be no reformation without the leading of the Holy Spirit. There can be no change of life without that one great principle of faith, that Christ died for me. In John chapter 20 and verse 31 we read, But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. If we have differences, let them be based on the word and the word only, and let all other differences be put aside. We know and we're sure that as soon as the coming of the Lord approaches closer and closer, God's people will press together, always on that sure foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As Adventism was forming, it went through a period of existential crisis. To counter this, the Lord sent His Adventist people a most precious message in 1888, which we know as the message of Christ our righteousness. In a special letter to the church, the servant of the Lord wrote, and it's recorded in Testimonies to Ministers, page 91, that this message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Emboldened with this knowledge that the righteousness of Christ could be claimed and made manifest in the life of believers, many began to accept this message. During the First World War, their faith was tested. The church in Europe decided on August 2, 1914, to tell its members to serve in combat roles in the military. And two days later, on August 4, 1914, sent a letter to the German war ministry that not only would Adventists bear arms, but they would also do so on the Sabbath. Faithful souls who were deeply seeking after God saw that this was a complete violation of the principles of God's government. It contravened both our relationship with God, violating the Sabbath in the fourth commandment, and our relationship with each other, killing as outlined in the sixth commandment. 
They began to speak out against this change in church doctrine and were rewarded by being kicked out of the church. By the end of 1914, about 4,000 had been disfellowshipped in 16 countries for not accepting the new church position of Sabbath keeping and military service. Once the war finished, these disfellowshipped attempted to be restored to the church, but were denied. And finally, in 1925, recognizing that they needed organization to complete the gospel mission, the SDRM was born. Now, I know that most mainline Adventists think at this point this question. Why not just try and reform the existing church? There should not be separation. Well, first, remember that the initial reformers did not leave the church. They were disfellowshipped from the church. And in any case, inspiration serves as our guide in this point. In every example we have recorded, Reformation has always begun within a church and always ended outside of that church in the time of Christ. We read in Desire of Ages, page 231 and 232. If the leaders in Israel had received Christ, he would have honored them as his messengers to carry the gospel to the world. To them first was given the opportunity to become heralds of the kingdom and grace of God. But Israel knew not the time of her visitation. The jealousy and distrust of the Jewish leaders had ripened into open hatred, and the hearts of the people were turned away from Jesus. The Sanhedrin had rejected Christ's message and was bent upon his death. Therefore, Jesus departed from Jerusalem, from the priests, the temple, the religious leaders, the people who had been instructed in the law, and turned to another class to proclaim his message and to gather out those who should carry the gospel to all nations. As the light and life of men was rejected by the ecclesiastical authorities in the days of Christ, so it has been rejected in every succeeding generation. Again and again, the history of Christ's withdrawal from Judea has been repeated. We can mutually respect the religious convictions of others, but we should never be obliged to accept them, especially if we believe them to contravene God's word. There are times then when separation is essential. An example of this can be found in the experience of the early church. In Great Controversy, page 45, we read, After a long and severe conflict, the faithful few decided to dissolve all union with the apostate church if she still refused to free herself from falsehood and idolatry. They saw that separation was an absolute necessity if they would obey the word of God. They dared not tolerate errors fatal to their own souls and set an example which would imperil the faith of their children and children's children. To secure peace and unity, they were ready to make any concession consistent with fidelity to God. But they felt that even peace would be too dearly purchased at the sacrifice of principle. If unity could be secured only by the compromise of truth and righteousness, then let there be difference and even war. In the next few presentations, you will see that the reformers that are alive today are just sinners like everybody else who seek to fellowship together in an environment where their walk with God will be supported by His Word and His Word alone. The experience of the Protestant Reformation guides our present experience. In Desire of Ages, page 232, it says, When the Reformers preached the Word of God, they had no thought of separating themselves from the established church. But the religious leaders would not tolerate the light, and those that bore it were forced to seek another class who were longing for the truth. In our day, Few of the professed followers of the Reformers are actuated by their spirit. Few are listening for the voice of God 
and ready to accept truth in whatever guise it may be presented. Often, those who follow in the steps of the Reformers are forced to turn away from the churches they love in order to declare the plain teaching of the Word of God. And many times, those who are seeking for light are by the same teaching obliged to leave the church of their fathers that they may render obedience. Back in 1914, there were only a few main differences, namely Sabbath keeping and combat military service. Over the years, as the mainline SDA church has continued to change, the number of differences has increased. Join us in this brief series and see old paths that we have been called to restore in order to render obedience to God and experience fully the transforming power of the righteousness of Christ.